Historical fiction, I tend to obsess on things. And so, so whenever I, I come across something that fascinates me, uh, then that will blow up into something bigger. Hello, and welcome to History Through Fiction, the podcast. I'm Colin Mustful, host of the program, and today I am delighted to be joined by Jason Lee Willis, author of numerous books and novels, including The Wintermaker, Examining Christmas, and Tales from the Haunted Valley. When I take them and the reader on that journey, uh, then you know, I, I want to go to some interesting places. Jason Lee Willis is a prolific author who teaches high school English, indigenous studies, creative writing, and mythology. His writing includes several novels, two short story collections, and two biblical study guides. Jason grew up in South Dakota and currently lives in Minnesota. His upcoming projects include The Alchemist Map, a thriller about French explorer Joseph Nicolet, and The Alchemist's Stone, a follow-up prequel thriller about French explorer Pierre-Charles Lesueur. Okay, well, I'd like to start with your Amazon bio. Uh, you state that you wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to write 1,000 words. Is that true? And, and what, what motivates you to do that? Oh, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, as a high school English teacher, that's, um, it's kind of like time that I can protect. Uh, you know, if I have a bad day at school, I found it was too unpredictable to try to write when I got home. Uh, so yeah, the five o'clock in the morning, the coffee is set for a timer and, and I get up and, you know, during uh, national November writing month, you know, I actually, you know, I, I get closer to the, the 1600 to 2000 mark. Um, it, but typically on average, yeah, that's my, my goal is I try to get that uh, thousand words before I get on with my day. And how do you decide what to write about? Do you stick to one particular project? Do you just do some journaling? What do you write about? Uh, you know, it depends on the time of year, to be honest with you. Uh, usually I save a new novel for November 1st. And so I, I go on that until I exhaust myself or, <laughs> or the story's done. And then uh, during uh, other times of the year, it really depends on, you know, sometimes it'll be, um, you know, like modifying a manuscript. And so I'll get up and be working on that. Uh, so that that's just kind of, you know, I, I rotate usually like two or three projects during the year in different stages. So mm -hmm. it's just, I, I, <laughs> I've got plenty of things to juggle. <laughs> that sounds very productive. Do you handwrite? Do you type? Do you oh, use a typewriter? What do you prefer? Oh, I, I'm, I'm a word processor. So I, I you know, I use Google Docs. Um, mm -hmm. Um, and then usually once I get into like the, the formatting mode, that's when I switch over to word. Uh, I do, I do find it fascinating that the spell checks between, uh, Google and word, uh, will catch different things. <laughs> so yeah, I'm finding so, that myself. Yeah. I, I do the exact same thing, switch from one to the other. Yep. That helps. <laughs> so let's talk about some of those projects. I, I see, I mean, you're quite a prolific author. You have mystery, short stories, uh, Christian nonfiction, occult, native heritage, historical fiction. T tell me more about the genres. Uh, which ones do you like writing about the most, and wh why do you, you know, expand into so many different uh, types of literature? I guess for me, I, I just have a, a love of writing um, more than a love of making money. 
<laughs> yeah, my, my day job's an English teacher. So what's the only like step down for like hourly wage would probably be a writer. <laughs> so so I'm not usually chasing after the dollars. And so for me, I just uh, I'm always looking for just new personal challenges. And so I've I've kind of just enjoyed dabbling in different genres um, just to see kind of what, what it feels like, you know, what, what it's, what's out there for me. Uh, so, you know, um, I don't know, it's just, I, I'm starting to find my niche, but, um, it's one of those that it's, it's part of just exploring who you are too. So whether it's the historical fiction, I tend to obsess on things. And so, so whenever I, I come across something that fascinates me, uh, then that will blow up into something bigger. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's, I don't know. I just, I have diverse interests. <laughs> well, as you, as you've progressed as a writer, uh, I see you've launched your own press, Lure Up uh, Publishing. Why did you do that? And, and tell me about that progression of what you've learned and, and where you are now and where you see yourself going. Oh, well, you know, I, I wouldn't really even call it my own press. It's just kind of like, you know, my own, um, you know, business account. Um, you know, I'm kind of just taking care of my own books, uh, with sure. that. So, you know, so that, that's just kind of an imprint. I just got an LLC and was just, you know, for an English teacher, uh, you know, dabbling in any sort of like legal things or business things, it's a little terrifying. So that was a big step for me personally. Um, you yeah, know, but I, I just, um, I just did that to, um, give myself, I don't know, a diverse platform. Mm. Just learn about their heritage. How oh. did you incorporate that into your classroom and into your writing? Well, I, I really, um, about a decade ago, uh, the new state standards came out. And when I saw there was Native American you know, literature standard, oh man, that was just like right up my alley. I, you know, since, since I was uh, a little tyke, uh, that's been kind of a love of mine. Uh, and, you know, I had, I had some other classes like mythology class uh, before that. Uh, but what I was able to do then I kind of looked at what the history department was doing and they had a little sixth grade unit on, you know, Minnesota history and, and there's some other things, but you know, when you're looking at the history curriculum, you know, there's only so many avenues to do that. And so I really enjoyed uh, being able to pull together kind of two units. Um, I had it as kind of a research unit and then I also had it as a, a folktale unit. Uh, I am a storyteller by heart. And, and so what I was able to do then with my students is I was able to teach them kind of about the, the two dominant Native American cultures, you know, the Ojibwe, the Dakota. Uh, and so we were able to really have kind of a folklore unit where I introduced, uh, you know, certain aspects. And then we, uh, I was able to allow them to kind of do some research on their own. And so that's been really rewarding for me. I've been doing that for about 10 years now. And so as, as, as they have done their own research, are their stories a part of uh, the short story collections that you've published? Oh yeah, that's, that's a, <laughs> that's another area that I kind of branched into. And that's where, um, when I was talking, I have a different class, uh, creative writing trimester. And those are usually older kids. And so my sophomores will usually have my Native American folklore unit. Uh, they'll have, you know, the research kind of taken care of already. So the, the older kids, then they kind of know, you know, where some of my loves are. And a couple of years back when we were trying to talk about, you know, hey, if we put together a collection of short stories, what do we want to call this? And through some of the, the local lore, uh, we had already discovered that the area in which my school district is found uh, was referred to by a local historian as, you know, the Haunted Valley. And, oh, did we love that idea. So we, we really, we dug into that. We pulled out the old, uh, uh, you know, there's a chapter from the local historian who talked about the history of Blue Earth. It was, it was like early 1900s. And so we pulled that out and, and there were, uh, I don't know about like five or six outlandish tales, uh, kind of Native American lore. Um, and so we really gravitated to that. And so uh, the last few years then, uh, that's what it's been called, Tales from the Haunted Valley. Uh, some of the kids like to try, you know, the historical fiction. 
some like the paranormal, uh, but with all of them, it's, you know, it's coming from our school district, which is, you know, <laughs> according to the legends and lore, a haunted place that no one would, with a sane mind would enter into. So high school kids love that sort of stuff. Yeah, it definitely sounds fun. And <laughs> you're using that as a fundraiser, is that right? Yes, yes. And so what, what I do with that, and that's really fun um, for me to kind of stay in touch with my student writers, is, you know, I'll go out to a book festival. You know, and if it's somebody that, um, you know, I have guest writers come in from time to time, depending on the blizzard situation. Uh, but I have, I have them come in and we'll meet them and then I'll be out, you know, selling books and they'll come by and, you know, take a picture with <laughs> the kids books, you know. And so it's, it's been really fun for them to kind of like know that their work is out there. And, um, you know, usually it's supported by local writers that understand uh, what a tough market it is. But it's, it's, it's really fun for them because then I'll, I'll, I'll send out little updates like, hey, I was in Hackensack today and we sold five books, you know. Uh, it's so it's kind of fun for me to just, you know, keep in touch with them. And so the money that uh, I make from that, usually sometimes it'll be like a, a swap for a book, you know, so somebody will come up and we'll, we'll trade a book. Um, if they, if somebody buys it outright, then, you know, I just kind of keep a little, uh, log as far as that goes. And then I'm able to reinvest the money. So I have a, a pretty nice library of Minnesota authors that I've, um, received personal copies from. So that's kind of fun. Yeah, that's great. And, and for those who, who are listening, who don't know, both Jason and I are from Minnesota. And when he says the, the blizzard situation, <laughs> he means at any point during the winter, there could be a blizzard and, and your uh, guest speakers won't make it, right? Yeah, yeah. Two years ago, we lost February. <laughs> yeah, we just we just lost it. You know, we were in the middle of writing the short stories, and the kids were really doing a good job. And all of a sudden, I think it was, um, I think it was eighteen contact dates, where it was either an early out, uh, a late start, or school canceled. We lost mm -hmm. eighteen days over the last. I think it was like five weeks. Well, that happens, unfortunately. Yep. <laughs> So I wonder if you could get into a little bit more talking about your craft here. So I'm actually curious about how you incorporate the Native American heritage into elements of fiction, into character development and description, and if that's any different from incorporating historical elements. Oh yeah, it get you know it's it gives me trepidation is is what it does because you know I have such reverence that you know I I don't want to you know, mess things up. You know, I've, um, I've read native American lore, uh, for years and years now. And so, um, you know, I had to kind of juggle how I wanted to do it. You know, I, I'm always looking at different perspectives, trying to, you know, get things done right now in, in my, in my world, you know, I have kind of a, you know, I would, I would call it more, akin to like a Stephen King uh, type situation than historical fiction. But I, you know, I wanted it set here in Minnesota and I wanted to have, um, you know, like Stephen King does with, you know, the, the main culture is there. I try, I wanted to have something that was a little bit more uh, Minnesota. And so um, from both the Dakota and the Ojibwe, I, I really did probably way more, um, reading and digging than I needed to because you know I have it, it kind of kind of woven through the backbone of my series. It's called the Dreamcatchers Chronicles, and it really is about a modern day family um, who's kind of discovering who they are. Uh, you mentioned some of my students uh, that were in my tenth grade class, and that's something I've noticed through the years. The various levels of not knowing, you know, whether I, you know, I've had students who had, you know, kind of mixed backgrounds, mixed heritage, you know, they will be an eighth or a quarter, um, native American. And, and they really, you know, they don't really talk about it. You know, it, they don't really look into it. And so my, my characters then are, are kind of in that same vein where it's like, you know, like they're in kind of a journey of discovery as far as like who they are. And so when I, you know, when I take them and the reader on that journey, uh, then, you know, I, I want to go to some interesting places. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any reluctance from your, your students? And on the other side, have you seen any kind of transformation after you've um, brought them through that? 
oh, you know, um, <laughs> it's it all depends on how the uh, the students see me in the first place, you know, because when I I put certain things up on pedestals. And, and so for me, you know, like, um, you know, when I sit down and introduce the unit and I'm enthusiastic about it, um, you know, it depends on the kid from year to year. Some kids will like as soon as I start talking about Native American culture, you know, their heads will go down because they don't want to be put in a spotlight. Uh -huh. And other kids like, you know, in, in recent years, you know, like, hey, I'm Ojibwe, you know, and so, so suddenly, you know, he, he perks up and he starts talking about that and, you know, they will gravitate towards it. And, you know, so it'll be a, a fun couple of weeks, you know, depending on um, kind of the, the kid who, you know, that is experiencing it. Um, so, you know, and so part of what my responsibility is just as an educator, you know, I'm not a history teacher. Uh, and so I'm usually coming to it from like the legends and lore perspective. Um, you know, but I, I try to talk about how, you know, like this is who we are here in Southern Minnesota. You know, this is what Minnesota's culture is, you know, prior to 150 years ago. So part of it is just, you know, trying to get them with a, a bit of respect and familiarity. Mm -hmm. Well, from what I've read and in your YouTube um, videos that I've watched, you, you just do an excellent job of laying it all out and doing it uh, objectively as at least as much as possible. Oh, than... I'm, I, <laughs> I try. Like I said, that's that's my biggest concern is, you know, um, I, I'm into, you know, the, the story uh, more than the history sometimes. And so <laughs> I, I tend to gravitate towards the uh, the most outlandish extreme things I can find. So sure. <laughs> I well, always have, love have the, you, the have epic. You... <laughs> Have you received any pushback or had any discussions about cultural appropriation? Oh, I wish I was big enough that anybody would yeah. notice me. Yeah. <laughs> like if I was, you know, JK Rowling, uh, <laughs> you know, she, she gets like, you know, grief about that sort of stuff with, yeah. uh, you know, she, she had like an, a native American, um, I'm sorry, an American, uh, version of, uh, Hogwarts with the, the different, you know, native American schools. And so, um, you know, I, I, that does concern me, you know, it is something that is always in the back of my mind, you know, kind of one of those gulp moments. Uh, and that's why I tried to have, you know, my, my modern characters, you know, I, I have a, a family who like my main character, he, he's an eighth. And so he's trying to understand who he is, um, really with almost a disconnect, uh, from his past. And so that, that's how I always try to do it. You know, that it's, um, you know, trying to figure out who he is and in a way take the reader along, uh, with a discovery too, you know, cause from him, he, he's not part of the community as much. Um, you know, and, and so my characters are trying to understand the past, um, more than what it's like, living life now. So that, that's where I, I, I tried to steer that. Now I do have one character. Um, you were talking about my 10th grade class and how we do research. And so, um, you know, when I, I put together my research project, um, I had a, a couple, you know, I, I gathered up materials for the kids as kind of like a little like dry run before they did their own individual research. And so I always had, um, you know, one of the like three or four options was the, um, battle of sugar point. And I know you're familiar with that because I've seen you, you know, posting a lot of links about that. But do you have a book on that? I do not. No. Okay. I yeah, I just I've I've seen a lot of links from you about that. Uh, but I had articles about that, and so, um, you know, we were, you know, it's always the same like five pages of information for me. So I got to know those five pages really well. But in one of the stories, there was, um, you know, it was once the the conflict had escalated, and they were already on Bear Island you know, and, and things were pinned down. Uh, but in the middle of this, you know, shootout, uh, between the Anishinaabe and the United States forces, uh, there's this anecdote about this young woman that was in a canoe that just goes paddling right through the channel. And, and that was my character, you know, that, that wow. little like drama right there was, you know, like, ah, who is she? Where was she going? You know, what was so important, you know, uh, and, and those little things like that is just kind of where, you know, I steal, um, the material from. <laughs> well, you know, it definitely shows a mindset of a storyteller. What What's the title of that story? Oh, that was the fire handler. Uh, okay. And so that that's the that's the closest one that I have to historical fiction, uh, because I, I set it in the 1890s, where, um, you know, she is an elderly woman 
in in kind of the present setting of the story, uh, kind of like doing a first person narrative telling her great grandson about what happened. And that great grandson's my main character, the kind of the vehicle. Uh, and so that that's, you know, kind of you know, I, I had to dig up a lot of stuff about what was going on. Now, I made a fictional county, you know, so in my stories, I tried to do that to kind of sever the tie between historical fiction and just, um, you know, regular fiction. And so I, I made a historical, I'm sorry, a, a fake county. Um, but you know, outside of that little bubble, there's real things going on from real life historical. And so, you know, Leech Lake was just to the north of where I put my, my fictional county. Mm -hmm. So do you start then just, just researching the background a lot and that kind of starts sparking ideas for your, your characters and how you want to develop your story? Yeah. You know, really, um, part of it was just a curiosity. I grew up in South Dakota. And so when I, I came to you know Blue Earth County, uh, I just I just kind of go down rabbit holes, and you know I, I I just started to learn about the local history here, and it was Joseph Nicolet that took me up north uh, to the Anishinaabe territory, and so Nicolet was the one who named you know my county Blue Earth County, and you know we've got Nicolet County on the other side of the river. So when I I was just curious. Uh, and digging into that bit of history, you know, I read the the Nicolette accounts, and and that's where I found out that he went right into the heart of where I'd kind of put my fictional county, and I was all like, "Dang, <laughs> what a coincidence!" I wanted to use that, and you know, because part of me was uh, what I was looking at is like the whole like, you know, why did he call it Blue Earth County? What was he looking into, you know? And then to find out that you know when he was doing his first trip up the Mississippi, you know, in his notes, he keeps talking about places where he finds, you know, blue earth. And I was like, why is that on his radar? And so it was just kind of, I, I found those little like things to play with. And, and that was kind of a fun little crossover between where I live and where I set my fictional place. So you've kind of led into it already, but why don't you tell us about these projects you're working on with Nicolet and Lesur? I think it's the Alchemist map, and you you said it's an Indiana Jones on the prairie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, again, you know, when when I I talked about it was just the like, well, there's there's no copper here, you know? And so when you find out that it was called Blue Earth County because, uh, uh, you know, 300 years ago, a man by the name of Pierre Charles Lesueur came here and, and put up a copper mine. And then Nicolette, you know, 150 years later, went looking for the copper mine and there's no copper. Uh, it was just like, what is going on here? Uh, and so I just found it to be a real like fun conspiracy theory as far as like, okay, what were these guys doing if there was no copper to begin with? Uh, and so that's where, you know, the Indiana Jones idea, you know, kind of popped in my mind. Uh, and so I, I, I guess I treated a lot more playfully, uh, than his, you know, than, than regular stuff. Um, but you know, that, that series then is, you know, the whole concept when I started to look at, uh, the fun things that Nicolet, uh, put on his map. So I've just spent, uh, two of the last three summers, uh, kind of like, going to all the places that Nicolette went um, as I'm working on the Nicolette book, which will lead me into the uh, Lesur book. Uh, but it's it's fun because here is this man, kind of like the Indiana Jones, where he is a renowned scholar and expert, but he really loved the paranormal kind of stuff. And so, you know, whenever whenever he goes um, to certain places, if there's a spirit lake or a Lake Manitou or anything that's like slightly paranormal in culture, whether it be Dakota culture or um, Anishinaabe culture, he always would have to go see it, you know? And so he, his, his little like, you know, his, his historical governmental tour uh, took some really goofy um, 
you know, side tracks and, um, and even some of the little things that he put onto uh, his map. Uh, were, there were just some really fun things that I was able to, you know, kind of turn it into more of an Indiana Jones thriller um, than anything. So is this uh, an upcoming novel? Uh, yeah, I, I've been that the Alchemist map I've been um, bouncing around. It, it's it's in its final stages. Um, I don't have a publisher for it right now, but it's, you know, it's been, it's been done for a few years now and I'm just kind of, um, you know, trying to, you know, hone it a little bit. Um, the hardest thing about writing that one and that, that really taught me a lot was with Nicolette. Uh, there was so much real history, um, that kind of like locked the story in. Uh -huh. uh, and, and that was really hard for me because I, you know, I, I, I did all the research and then I, I dump it all out on paper and I would test it on people. And, you know, I, where, what I'd find fascinating is like, and he met this person here and he met this person here and, and they're all like, I have no idea who these people are. And so I would have to like, you know, lose things for the sake of narrative uh, things that I found fascinating that I couldn't find anybody else that found it as fascinating as me. Uh, so that's where I kind of have, uh, you know, when I, I started, it was the first draft of it was I tried to keep it almost entirely like historically accurate, true to life, you know, from, you know, what he was doing. And, and, and then I, I decided to just kind of Dan Brown it a little bit, you know, put a little bit more Da Vinci code in it and have some more uh, fun with it. So, mm -hmm. it, so it's, it's kind of, like I said, it's in its final stages of me polishing. Um, this is again about the, the sixth or sixth kind of revision of it from me. Um, and so I, I'm really happy with where it's at right now. And the, the Lesur one, I wrote that one, um, probably about like two years ago, just to make sure I had that kind of locked in, uh, with how it was going to fit with the Nicolette book. Well, I think it's going to be, a, um, I will look forward to, to reading it just from what I've seen. So for those who don't know, you have, uh, these YouTube videos where you, like you said, you go out to these locations and give a little bit of a, a historical narrative of what was going on at that time. So I've been getting up in the morning, getting a bowl of cereal and turning on YouTube <laughs> <laughs> and watching these, uh, these YouTube videos that you've done. I wonder if you can uh, take us behind the scenes a little bit, because it seems like they, they have pretty good production value with the music and the maps. Well, I, the I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting better. Okay. So, so that was, the, the first year it was pretty, it was a little rough because, um, you know, my, I have a FIED teacher who's a friend and the first year we just, I went with him. We grabbed a couple of canoes. I, I took my freshman son and a freshman friend of his. And so we just like went out camping, you know, mm -hmm. we just bought, you know, kind of followed the 1838 trip. So uh, we started off um, at, uh, at St. Peter and then, you know, where Nicolette just kind of like went off the trail at St. Peter, we just like be bopped it down the highway. And so we followed the entire path. Uh, where he went all the way out to uh, South Dakota uh, and then back around to uh, Renville's cabin at Lac Parle and then back down the river. So we, we just kind of like reenacted it, which was a blast. Uh, but the, like you were, the, <laughs> the, the audio quality, uh, the, we didn't think, uh, you know, the, the second year we had a teleprompter. And so that made life much easier. But the first year I would just, they'd say action. And I would just have to like recall stuff off the top of my head, you know, with like squirrels running around the trees and like, you know, like people stopping on the trail and looking uh -huh. at me. So, so that one was, uh, it, it was, I don't know, it, it was really fun. Uh, but yeah, I learned a lot of lessons from it that first year. And then last summer uh, we went out, uh, I have a, a former student of mine who's a journalism major. And so he helped me, um, you know, kind of like get some nice lighting and find some good spots. And uh, so that that was much more enjoyable last year just because we were able to kind of nail it in one or two takes. But mm -hmm. uh, I've been doing journalism at the high school level for a few years. So it was kind of fun for me to uh, actually do what I've been allowing my students to do. Uh, and so it's it's been a real love of mine. I'm, I'm going to be going um, doing the 1839 trip. And so I'll be filming a bunch of stuff, um, 
from Nicolet's kind of third expedition this summer. And I'm hoping that, you know, but I'll have these filmed so that when I finally do find a home for the novel, if people are interested, they'll be able to check those out. So in a weird sort of way, the videos are the cart before the horse. You know, I'm making those uh -huh. videos in anticipation of the novel coming out, but. I'm glad you enjoyed them. <laughs> yeah, my no, uncle that's... Dave, my uncle Dave and Colin love the historical videos. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lot easier than going in and actually reading Nicholas journal to have you describe it all and, and show us the map. And of course your little diagram of the guy moving on the rivers is pretty cute. So. <laughs> that, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little cheesy, but I'm like, oh, well, yeah, that, that way they don't take me seriously when they see a big bobblehead of Nicolet on a wagon going across the frontier, uh -huh. you know? Um, but I, I, I did um, kind of fall in love with the character of Nicolet though. Just, I, I kind of alluded to he's, you know, the Indiana Jones where he's the professor that goes out and has an adventure. Uh, he reminds me a lot of um, Tolkien's Bilbo Baggins or Frodo Baggins too, where he, there's nothing macho about him at all. He's just this dainty little fella. Uh, but man, did he go on some epic adventures. And we, we found ourselves worn out in a modern situation following these same paths that he took. Last, last year, we, um, we were paddling around the Crow Wing River. And, and we were like, how does a, a, you know, a French scientist that's like five years older than us hack this, you know? Mm -hmm. So we, we had a lot of respect for him when we uh, finished those two trips. Well, I think it's, it's great. Um, so with all, uh, everything that you've written for someone who hasn't read any of your work, if they, if they had to choose just one to read, which one should they look to and why? Oh, um, that, that's an that's an interesting uh, question as far as like which one. Uh, it's always the next one that's my <laughs> my yeah. favorite. You know, it's like check out the ne the, ne the this next one. Um, you know, I'm I'm really uh, I'm happy with the way the Fire Handler and the Winter Maker came out. Um, you know, I I kind of um, you know because what you get with the Winter Maker is I have kind of a dual timeline story. So there's a little, you know, histor there's historical fiction in it, but then you also have the, the modern. So it kind of gives a, a little bit of both styles that I like. Um, so I, I would say The Fire Handler uh, for right now, the, this, a new book that I'm working on that's not the Nicolette book, uh, that, that's going to be kind of my lead dog into uh, my Dreamcatcher Chronicles. Okay. Do you have a working title for that? Uh, the, the Raven and the Willow. Um, I, um, again, I'm a mythology teacher. And so both the, the mythology of the willow and the mythology, of the raven, um, are, are kind of the two motifs that I go into with that one. Um, I almost called it the Thunderbird, but everybody that I showed the title to, cause I love the Thunderbird from native American mythology, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, that's just the perfect title for me. Uh, but every time I would show the title, they're like Ford Thunderbird. <laughs> and I, you know, I couldn't get anybody past the yeah. title. And so that's where I decided to make it a little bit more cryptic with the raven and the willow. Um, you know, the willow tree um, is, you know, with Anishinaabe culture where the, it, it's kind of the, the creator of the dream catcher. You know, there's a lot of dream catchers out there in the world right now, uh, different cultures, but the Anishinaabe with the, the grandmother spider story um, a, a dream catcher is supposed to be made out of a willow branch and it's not supposed to be one of the circle ones. It's supposed to be a teardrop loop. Uh, and so that's where, you know, the willow kind of comes in and then the Raven, you know, from, you know, all sorts of mythologies. Um, I thought that was a good connection with the, uh, the tale of the Thunderbird too. Well, I will definitely look forward to that as well as your other projects. It sounds like you are extremely busy uh, but <laughs> I, I'm just I'm just an English teacher uh, looking for new things to kind of like keep my attention, I guess. <laughs> well, I've been talking with Jason Lee Willis, a prolific author and the author of an upcoming novel, The Alchemist Map. Jason, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for inviting me, Colin.
you know, I have the sense of accomplishment, uh, regardless of whether I'm going to sell one copy, a hundred or a thousand, you know? And so I, I kind of talked to them about that's how you need to address art.